What I want to do this evening is really start with a bit of history that I suspect you all know, um, or at least all think we know. Um, I want to start with the Riot Act of 1715. This is the origin, of course, of the phrase, reading the Riot Act, used by generation of parents at bedtime and ignored by generations of children. It was passed as one of the first acts of the new Hanoverian regime in 1714 and came into effect early the next year and was a response to the politics of the moment, to that early Georgian moment of regime change and of attempted counter-revolution associated with the 15. And one way or another, it stayed on the statute books until 1967. And since it created riot as a new kind of felony, subject to the death penalty until the beginning of the 19th century, historians have tended to see it as part of the bloody code under which some 250 minor offenses um, became subject to the death penalty, imposed seemingly at random at the whim of a judge. The bloody code was a system of brutal privilege an elite suppression of working class lives that dominated the criminal justice system and was only reformed in the 1830s when most crimes associated with the death penalty were made non-capital and meant that the theft of a few pence or going about in disguise might lead to that kind of nauseating scene of execution at Tyburn, that slow ritualized death by strangulation made familiar by William Hogarth. And it's true. The 18th century can be seen in that light, can be seen as a moment of brutal imposition of a cruel and offensive system of execution and torture. And hundreds were hanged. At its most hubristic, the bloody code led to absolute abominations. This is Smuglerius an écorché created in 1776 for the edification of genteel students at the Royal Academy of Arts. This was created from the hanged body of a coal heaver and part-time smuggler from Deptford, probably by the name of Thomas Henman. Convicted of murder, Henman was sentenced to hang at Tyburn and his body to be dissected at the Royal College of Surgeons, but instead, his lifeless form was handed over to William Hunter and on to the Royal Academy of Arts, where Augustino Carlini first flayed his body as it seized in rigor mortis and put it in the pose of what at the time was known as the dying gladiator. Henman's body was then cast in plaster of Paris, which in turn formed the basis for Smuglerius, a figure used in life drawing classes at the Royal Academy for at least the next 150 years. In other words, the bloody code, that 18th century tolerance of violence, of cruelty, of mere well, unthinking brutality, is real. But the point about it for this evening is that its workings did not include the policing of riot. This evening, I want to suggest that to understand the popular politics of the period and the rise of democratic politics in the 19th century, we need to understand 18th century London not simply as a reflection of the bloody code and the social relations which it encodes, but in a different way. Not in the first instance as that polarized world of elite power and plebeian suffering, but as something more fully negotiated. And as part of this, we need to understand the riot as something other than a component of that bloody code. And the point is that the act, the riot act, stipulated that when confronted with a tumult, tumult or a riotous assembly of 12 or more people, a magistrate should read the following. Our sovereign lord, the king, charleth and commandeth all persons assembled immediately to disperse themselves and peaceably to depart to their habitations or to their lawful business upon the pains contained in the act, God save the king. They were to do so in a loud voice. But having read that act, having read that statement, and you can imagine the scene. Here is a, um, a sweaty justice rushed to the site of a riot trying to control a situation. 
um, standing wherever he could in order to be heard. Having read that act, the magistrate was then charged to hang around for precisely an hour. And if at the end of that 60 minutes, the riot was still in progress, they were authorized only then to send for a troop of soldiers to help put down um, the riot with force. And if caught at the end of that hour, a rioter could be charged with a felony and hanged. For me, there seems to be a couple of problems with that. And the first is how to interpret that 60 minutes. I can think of no other crime dealt with in quite that way. If I was robbing a bank, the very intention of robbing a bank is criminal. And yet, throughout the 18th century, you had to persevere in rioting for more than an hour before the crime was even committed. Personally, I would long since be knackered and down the pub. I mean, an hour, it's hard work. And what this implies is that the Riot Act was as much about legitimating and controlling the role of local magistrates and how they used the military as it was about policing riots. It wasn't about punishing rioters. It was about finding a framework in which um, a military force could be used effectively in a civilian context. The main provision of the act was to state unequivocally that no soldier could be prosecuted for firing on a member of the public if that exchange play, um, took place after the magistrate had read the act and an hour had elapsed. It was essentially a way of making sure that no one as a police figure with a gun was going to be charged. If you want a modern parallel, think of the Black Lives Matters movement in the US and the inability of the criminal justice system there to seemingly hold any armed um, police officer to account for their actions. To the extent to which the army served as Britain's own police and only police in 18th century London, the relationship between power and the mob was more circumscribed following the Riot Act than it is in most parts of the world today. And there's one other aspect of the Riot Act that leaves me bemused. While the Riot Act was used a dozen occasion, on a dozen occasions in the 10 years after its passage, at that moment of Hanoverian anxiety following the new regime, primarily to prosecute people involved in the anti-Hanoverian Mughouse riots of the 1710s and early 20s, for most of the 18th century, it was pretty much a dead letter with the exception of the prosecutions following the Gordon riots in 1780, of which much more in a minute. Between 1725 and 1780, only 23 people were tried at the Old Bailey for a riot. And of those, only two were sentenced to hang, of whom only one, the tragically unlucky Bosavir Penlez, was actually executed. A measure of how unusual his execution was is that representations of his ghost regularly appeared in subsequent demonstrations. Basically, at most riots following his execution, somebody would get dressed up as Basra and Penlez um, in makeup and in a coffin and be carried along by, by a crowd. It was, if you like, a, a, um, a sign and a signifier of how 18th century, the 18th century populace thought things had gone wrong. And yet, in the decades leading up to 1780, London did see a huge number of riots. The image of 18th century London as a site of chaos, of disorder, of crime, and sexuality, which one finds in every popular account of the period, is not without foundation. And Bob Shoemaker, the guy who um, is equally responsible for the Old Bailey and the other um, websites that Mike uh, mentioned a moment ago, has demonstrated that while ri the Riot Act was seldom used, if you sur the survey the evidence for wider forms of riot in newspapers and local records, they occurred on average every other day, depending on how you define what a riot was. So what we have is a city of chaos, a city of riot, but not a city where riot is considered a crime despite what's on the statute book. These riots almost never resulted in formal prosecution, beyond perhaps the perpetrators being bound over to keep the peace. Instead, they reflect the extent to which there was a separate and ongoing culture and politics of disorder, 
Riot, in other words, was part of politics and not part of crime. And this really comes to one of the three points I want to make this evening. The first of, e of, the, of these is that despite the bloody code and the fact that 18th century London had no obvious form of democratic accountability, um, unless you were a householder, you couldn't um, vote for the vestry, unless you had a, were a substantial householder, you couldn't vote for your member of parliament. Um, that disorder and riot involved a political in, um, system that was remarkably inclusive. In the decades up to June 1780, in other words, there was a unique form of politics in which working people used violence and disorder to ensure their point of view was heard. And that this space for political violence was in many ways created by the Riot Act itself. That's the first point I want to make this evening. And second, that this system was overturned in one of the least remembered events of the 18th century, the Gordon Riots of 1780. I suspect most people in this room have heard of them. I suspect many of you have only a vague understanding of what happened that week. And, and in the questions, you can tell me I'm entirely wrong about that, by the way. And finally, third, that those riots, the Gordon riots, ushered in a very different system um, that forced the evolution of a new kind of politics and drove the evolution of the 19th century state. In other words, I want to suggest that we need to rethink a bit how we understand the making of the London working class and the making of the 19th century state as a new form, as something that changed the world. Now, the new unique characteristic of that pre-Lapsarian, pre-Gordon Riot's politics was that the disorder that accompanied political debate was itself remarkably orderly. Most riots before 1780 were nonviolent, and I say that with caveats. Certainly, there was very little violence against individuals. We cannot find anyone, if you like, killed in riot, apart um, from riots associated with the pillory. Windows were broken, and householders were encouraged to display lighted candles to show support. At its extreme, houses were attacked, and, and what was called at the time, pulled down. But that's a really misleading phrase. What it really meant was taking out the window frames and doors and furniture and using any wooden component of an otherwise brick house and taking it out in the street and turning it into a bonfire. What they were looking for was the materials for a bonfire rather than the, the destruction. And the, the sense of orderliness associated with that is, I think, captured by the extent to which what that does is ensure that London does not go up, up in flames. This was not about, um, if you like, unthinking violence. It was about a choreographed kind of violence. This is the um, St. Martin's Watch House um, after it had been pulled down um, in a riot in 1742. It was all of these, however, were riots with a set agenda, deploying a series of well-understood symbols all playing, if you like, to a clear tune. And as importantly, they were part of a continuum from organized processions and annual events to spontaneous interventions in local politics. This, of course, is um, I'm chairing the member as part of the um, Hogarth series of paintings um, where an MP is chaired at, uh, following being elected. And what you see again and again in images like this is, in part, the clear ritual of authority and validation that was involved, but also simply the violence at the edges. And this is equally true for the Lord Mayor's procession, for example. Always, year in, year out, marked by violence. But so were official anniversaries, coronations, royal birthdays and all. Queen Elizabeth's birthday, the 17th of November, celebrated rather than Guy Fawkes Day prior to 1752, was always violent and involved begging with menaces, bonfires, and of course lots and lots of drink. If you want a modern parallel, it would be Lewis's Guy Fawkes celebrations, which are simply scary. I don't know if anybody's ever been to them on a... Um, I used to take undergraduates 
um, until I decided that it was actually too dangerous um, to do so. Um, well, I, I was responsible for them. I could just see them getting into a fight somewhere. Anyway, of course, in spring at Lent, the apprentices were encouraged to pull down the body houses. It was in just that kind of riot that Basavar Penlez was caught participating and was then hanged as an example, largely at the behest of Henry Fielding, who was an utter bastard in that particular case, and in many others, um, despite the books. And then there were the butcher boys from Clara Market, who throughout the 18th century, every time there was a wedding, would go along, play rough music, demand alms and payment for um, drink later on, and bring an element not of celebration, but actually of fear, anxiety, and violence. These were well-fed young men with large cleavers in their hands. They were not unthreatening. And politicians often invited the mob to protest in support of their political parties and causes, again, giving that continuum where riot becomes normalized. The rage of party associated with the 1720s and 30s meant riot as well as published vitriol. Not only did crowds provide um, a means of physically intimidating one's opponents, they were also a means of demonstrating and claiming widespread public support for their point of view, often turning official um, anniversaries into partisan, partisan purposes. The attacks on Walpole in the 1740s are a classic example of riots used for political purpose. And the demonstrations in favor of um, Wilkes, John Wilkes in the 1760s, likewise. It was, if you like, how do you demonstrate, um, oh God, what is, it, what is the phrase? Um, grassroots support um, in a, a world where there are no newspapers and no polls. You do it by violence on the streets. And it was not just national politics. It was also the politics of the parish pump. Workhouses, for example, and, um, were established across most of London through the 1720s and 30s, and each new opening was generally marked by a riot, and the disputes occasionally succeeded in changing policy. And in parishes like St. Clement Danes and St. Paul's of Aldgate, or Aldersgate, rather, the attempts to impose a new type of vestry, a closed vestry in the 1730s, led again to riots and assemblies where alternative vestries were launched. This was, if you like, a visceral world of political dispute. In St. Um, Bolthoff Aldersgate, they grabbed the books from the legitimate vestry, went off to the pub, claimed themselves as a new open vestry, and started passing um, resolutions. And for a while, they succeeded in wresting control of local government. In other words, this period, which historians have frequently characterized as one of overweening state power, where that brutal fist of authority was used without um, let or hindrance, was also one in which there was a moral economy of riot that extended into a kind of popular political control. In many respects, it ensured that politics would be remarkably inclusive and responsive to popular opinion. When riot is so close, the politics of popular engagement has to be clear. Between riot and the rise of the world, a new world of print, following the lapsing of the Licensing Act in 1695, and you've got to remember, from 1695 through 1750, basically every form of print that we are familiar with, every kind of newspaper, tabloid, and, um, and handout was invented. There was a new explosion of print, print. So in combination with riot, what you suddenly had was the circulation of ideas, a circulation of texts, a circulation of material that was then turned into physical confrontation on the streets. And arguably, in that pre-1780 moment, there was more opportunity to hear the voice of the poor than would be true um, for, any, uh, for uh, any period after 1780. One of the things that I always come back to is that that middle period saw a profound and growing rise in the amount of money spent on poor relief in London decade by decade. The amount of resources given to the redistribution of wealth and the care of the poor was remarkable. 
And that is part of a different kind of politics. It is not a democratic politics of representation, but it is a politics of inclusion of some other sort. But that changed. The age of riot, if you like, did not last. What was arguably a space for working class anger and political participation was closed down in a single week. The Gordon riots erupted on a hot Friday, the 2nd of June, 1780. And within a week, at least 285 men and women were dead. And a further 173 were seriously injured. Some estimates put the dead and wounded as high as 700 people. The damage wreaked on the fabric of the city in a full week of rioting is estimated to have run to 200,000 pounds, when 200,000 pounds actually meant something, and 81 private homes and businesses were destroyed. The riots were the single most destructive instance of civil unrest in modern British history, and we have forgotten them for the most part. And while many of the individual riotous assemblies that make up that week of chaos, and it was a week of mayhem, mayhem, abided by that older tradition of pulling out windows of fires and um, bonfires. The sheer scale of those riots marked a profound turning point in British and London history. Now, the immediate trigger for the riots was the parliamentary agitation associated with Lord George Gordon who, as leader of the Protestant Association, sought the repeal of the Catholic Relief Act of 1778. That act had been passed because of the need to recruit Irish soldiers for the American War. And basically what it allowed the British military to do was to um, yeah, recruit Catholic uh, men because they needed troops so badly. But it was seen by contemporaries as an assault on a Protestant national identity. Underlying this, was economic dislocation, the costs of, a mount, of mounting a war against the Americans, and the longer term and deeply unpopular evolution of a new form of policing associated with the Bow Street Magistrates Court, Henry and John Fielding. But the Protestant Association mainly represents a form of anti-Catholic populism, an opposition movement created by an imagined threat to a romanticized past. To me, it feels very much like the anti-immigrant politics of the present or the rising politics of romantic nationalism of the sort that feels suddenly more common uh, across, across Europe. It was, if you like, looking back to warm beer and feasting, an idea that the community of the parish was somehow uniformly Protestant in the past and somehow inclusive and empowering. Following a mass meeting at St. George's Field, just south of the river, involving some 40,000 associationeers and a monster petition. It did take four people to carry it. Signed by 60,000 people. The afternoon, on the afternoon of Friday, the 2nd of June, there was a heated debate in Parliament with Lord Gordon attempting to use the milling crowds of excitable associationeers to drive through the repeal of the act. But as Parliament prevaricated and delayed, by evening, the riots had begun. Essentially, what was started as an attempt to innovate in politics, to if you like, create a kind of new, a new sort of populism, suddenly got out of hand and suddenly resulted in well, chaos. The Catholic chapel belonging to the Sardinian ambassador in Lincoln's Inn Fields and later the chapel belonging to the Bavarian embassy in Warwick Street were attacked and um, their windows torn out and bonfires started. Over the next week, the composition of the crowds that filled London streets grew ever more varied and the issue of Catholic emancipation um, receded. To follow James Gilray's assessment, and this print was made while the riots were going on and published on the last day of rioting, on the 9th of June, the rioters were mainly set on destruction and theft. Though he says he's a Protestant, look at the print. The face and the bludgeon will give you a hint. Religion, he cries, and hopes to deceive, while his practice is only to burn and to thieve. The famous set piece 
at the core of the riots occurred on Wednesday, the 7th of June, when Newgate Prison was attacked. It was a very pretty building. They just finished, they just finished it. It literally was 270 yards of brutal stone. And in my estimation, a cruel symbol, if you like, of the new power claimed by the likes of Henry and John, of John Fielding. And it sometimes seems as if half of London was either in the crowd before Newgate or looking down on the scene from the windows above. The owners of the houses across from Newgate actually were selling spaces at the windows for, uh, for I think it was just two shillings a, a pop. A mass, and what happened is that an incredible fury of destruction was unleashed. A massive stone edifice. It was, ma it was huge. The recently completed prison was almost entirely destroyed. It took another three years to rebuild it. And 117 prisoners from petty thieves to murderers were set loose on the streets. But that was in many ways just a beginning. The attack on Newgate was quickly followed by attacks on the King's Bench prison and, fleet, and the fleet, new prison and the House of Correction at Clerkenwell. The cause, in the words of Thomas Haycock, sentenced to hang for his role in the destruction of Justice Hyde's house and of Newgate's prison, was not by that Wednesday religion or even the courts, but to ensure that there should not be a prison standing in London. One after another, the prisons fell, or their keepers meekly opened their gates in hopes of preserving what at the time were private carceral fiefdoms. They basically contracted for the... Um, for, um, the care of the prisoners at a price. But perhaps most importantly, the Bank of England came under sustained attack and was only preserved from sacking by brute military force. The Battle of Fleet Street, as it became known, alone resulted in 60 dead or wounded rioters shot at close range. John Wilkes the supposed radical of the 1760s and 70s was at the fore, gun in hand, firing directly into the, uh, into the um, collected groups of working Londoners. As I say, 60 dead at the minimum, though the actual number may have been much higher as contemporary believe that many of the dead were unceremoniously pitched into the Thames to save them from being identified. Besides the prisons and the Bank of England, the rioters also assa um, assaulted the South Sea Company, the East India Company, the Excise Office, and the Customs House, the Navy Pay Office, the Vittling Office, Freemasons Hall, and Coots and Drummond's Banks. The riots were only finally suppressed through concerted military action on Thursday the 8th of June. In my estimation, it was an attempted revolution put down by force of arms and at the cost of hundreds of lives. And yet, oddly, it's not on the A-level syllabus. I don't get that. Besides those killed by the soldiery following the riots, at least 62 men and women were convicted under the Riot Act, and 26 of them were eventually hanged. And by its end, when calm fell on London on Friday the 9th of June, a few things had changed. First, because the Lord Mayor and many of the Justices of the Peace of London and Middlesex largely refused to read the Riot Act, refused to stand up and um, do their, their duty on that, and sanction the direct use of military force against the rioters, the King and the Privy Council essentially overturned the Constitution and statute law and ordered the troops to attack regardless. They took direct control of the military and intervened in civil society in a way that was supposedly illegal. In the process, they effectively undermined the role of justices of the peace, who for 65 years since the passage of the Riot Act had served as a civilian check on the use of troops. Furthermore, a standing army of 12,000 troops was used to suppress an attempted revolution. And in the process, the British state became, to all effects and purposes, a military state. Any division between the civil and the military evaporated in that moment. And at the same time, the parish worthies who had signed that monster petition at Lord Gordon's behest, who saw in a common defense of a confessional Protestant community a defense of their own liberties, 
were made to look again at their fellow Londoners and to find in the rioters harbingers of disorder and chaos rather than co-religionists and loyal subjects. Fear had been instilled in the hearts of Londoners and, the, and forced them to negotiate a new politics that had no place for riot. New parish associations, vigilantes, sprang up to police the streets. And most ominously, London became an armed camp. The prisons and the courts were quartered with troops and the parks filled with over 10,000 soldiers. And they stayed there. In the next decade, in a crisis of global proportions that started with the American Revolution in the late 1770s and only ended 30 years later with the collapse of Napoleonic, uh, Napoleonic France, Britain was forced to create a new kind of state and a new kind of empire. Between India and Australia, later Singapore, in, in relation to its changing um, relationship with the Caribbean and also um, Canada, the second British empire of military and economic control emerged to replace an economic empire of self-consciously Protestant settlers. What the riots had done was, as um, part of that crisis of the 1780s, was fundamentally change how the British state worked. And at its heart was a new London that was necessarily, in the eyes of the state at least, policed at the point of a bayonet. As far as we can tell, 1785 represents the high point in the history of capital punishment in Britain, with London witnessing 95 defendants condemned to, condemned to die at the Old Bailey in that single year. And in the process, London also became and would remain, and I would argue still is, an armed camp. They set up camp in Hyde Park and St. James's Park and outside the British Museum and at Blackheath, as well as at all the prisons. And they dug in for the long term. Simply going through some of Paul Samby's illustrations of the encampments gives you a sense of their sophistication. St. James's Park, the British Museum, Blackheath, and it was not just that the military were there, it was that they were in your face. A troop was permanently stationed at the Bank of England following the Gordon Rides, the Bank Piquette, and remained on station from 1783 to 1973. <laughs> Many people in this room probably remember them. And it was incredibly irritating. They marched back and forth, uh, anyway. You, I'm going to put it. Um, Gilray is, is, is better at this than I could ever be. London effectively became a militarized zone and would not stop being one forever. If you want to know the origins of the 40 barracks built in the London area in the last decade of the 18th century and the first decade of the 19th century, it lay in the need to house and supply this body of men, making sure that London did not flare into riot again the horse guards, the Royal Artillery Barracks at Woolwich, the Cavalry Barracks at Hounslow, and so on. Their origins are normally ascribed as a response to the French Revolution. Oh my god, the French are coming. Let's quickly build a, build a garrison. Completely, com conveniently implying that they were a response to an external foreign threat. But the reality was that they were put in place to police London and, and Londoners following the Gordon Riots. What was created in the decades after 1780 is what Joe Cousins has recently described as a dragoon state, in which a standing army was used to police a restive populace. If you want to know why Britain did not have a revolution in the 1790s, why it did not follow France, it was because the Gordon riots had allowed the state to prepare. In other words, the riots changed everything. We tend to think of the American and French revolutions as the pivotal moments when some form of modernity was created. And they did help to create a new politics of white male privilege. They were founded in the Enlightenment, and most people are probably happy to trace their own politics and values to the self-evident truths of the period. But that is at best only half the story. What the Gordon riots did was to tear down an older world order 
and discredit traditional beliefs in good governance by a Protestant king. They destroyed the reliance on local power and gave to the central government new powers, and with that encouraged the central government to create new systems of ordering the world. The 19th century British state was the most sophisticated bureaucracy the world had ever seen. I would argue that it was more sophisticated than the modern British state could ever be, particularly given its current um, state of, of political malaise. And it was remarkable for its mastery of data. It controlled the world and tens of millions of people with nothing more powerful than a quill pen and a ship of the line. Sorry, the ship of the line is probably more, well, I think the, the quill pen more so. And that entailed the creation of a series of forms of record keeping that when you confront them at the TNA, when you, um, when you start using them um, online, are remarkable even today. But if you think about them, looking forward from the 1770s and 80s, from a period where record keeping was fragmentary at the very least, and think about their consistency, it becomes ever more remarkable. The criminal registers from 1791, basically everybody who should, um, ended up in court, whether they were guilty or innocent, had their description taken, their, uh, their um, offense recorded, their place of birth, um, their height, their weight, their eye color. We suddenly have hundreds of thousands of physical descriptions for the first time in Western European history of tens and thousands of individual working men and women. And that was down to a revolution in record keeping. The transportation records from 1787 onwards, the tens of thousands of people transported to Australia and transported as part of a global system of penal colonies were remarkable. You can literally put together 40 or 50 different records for a single individual. I could tell you how much money everybody had in their bank account when they arrived in Australia through most of the 1820s and 30s. I can, I can um, tell you what the tattoos they had. We can actually tell what ship they were on by the different tattoos they had because every ship had one good tattoo artist. So <laughs> if you were on, on one ship, you got an anchor. If you got on, on another, you got an angel. It um, is a remarkable series of, of, of records. And of course, you then get the censuses. I mean, if you think about 1801, a census of every living person, where, where they lived, what their name was, what their age was, what household they were in, what their occupation was, and think about doing that on the back of creating that system, on the back of endless account books, quill pens, and untrained, um, untrained curate, curates in rural parishes. The achievement is remarkable. Then you get the network of domestic spies. You could not sit in a pub and talk about anything political without some spy or other apparently reporting back to the home office. And finally, you get the metropolitan police, if you like, a regularized, militarized police force that was unique in certainly the Anglophone world all recorded and controlled. By 1841, there was, of course, the first detective force. And the records that they kept are just amazing. When we digitized them, what we ended up doing, and we did for the digital Panopticon site, and I would recommend anybody have a look at it, um, what ended up coming out was the fact that, actually, you can incorporate and in, in, uh, connect tens, dozens of different records around single individuals, and they actually work. And in challenging the state, the Gordon riots also helped spirit in a new system. And this really is the final point I want to make. With that revolution in governance, with the destruction of old compromises and the creation of a new bureaucracy, there came a demand for a new kind of politics. You can already see it in the contested elections of Westminster for 1783, in which William Pitt and Charles James Fox sought to use the crowd in new ways. This wasn't riot. This was lobbying, kiss-assing, and um, all that goes with it. It was modern politics with all of its offensive baby-kissing and all that goes with it. But more importantly, over the next 40 years, 
Progressive and working class political movements was, uh, evolved to make something new. And by the end of the 18th century, the age of the mob was over. In 1799, a French visitor commented that despite seeing vast crowds during his stay in London, I have met with fewer disturbances in the fray than are to be seen at Paris in a single morning. And the place of the riots, and in place of those riots, came a different kind of politics. The London Corresponding Society never let a riot. And events such as the Peterloo Massacre were shocking precisely because the Riot Act was invoked and the dragoons were used, not against rioters, but against a peaceful crowd intent on doing nothing more threatening than listening to a few speeches and cheering on an alternative politics. You can look at the Luddites and the swing rioters of the 1810s and 20s and see counterfactuals in them. But the core of progressive politics had moved on from riot to demonstration. Those who might have rioted found other potentially more effective means of making their grievances known through voluntary societies and public meetings, which rapidly became more sophisticated in their methods for advocating change. Radical politicians adopted voluntary societies into the tactics of holding meetings indoors or when the crowd got too big outdoors but in a very controlled setting, publishing propaganda and conducting petitioning campaigns of a very different sort, presented to parliament as quietly as possible in many respects. And to the minds of most, the Gordon riots had demonstrated beyond doubt the dangers of unleashing the mob, the dangers of a kind of populism. The pressure to pass the Great Reform Act, however unsatisfactory the outcome, was generated through newspapers and lobbying. And when we are first confronted with photographic evidence of political action, it takes the form of a milling crowd, passive and expectant, but about as far from a riot as one can imagine. This is, of course, the um, Chartist demonstration in 1848, which is, as far as I know, the first um, photograph we have of any political event. With the end of the age of riot and disorderly politics came first a newly authoritarian state that outdid the bloody code simply by dint of excellent record keeping. And what this did in turn was demand some new way of influencing the actions of the state. The origins, if you like, of one person, one vote democracy lay in part in the failure of riot, in the failure of that 18th century system of the politics of the mob. Thanks much. <laughs>